While we were in college, we got to spend a lot of time together. Uh, we ate our meals together, we studied together, and then when curfew hit and had to go back to the dorm, we talked to each other over the phone. That was the modern technology that came to Southwest Baptist College. Our sophomore year, we could have actually have a phone in our dorm room. But then summer break came, and no longer are we together all the time. She's in Sedalia, Missouri, and I'm in Versailles, 45 miles apart. Now, if you remember back in 1970, or as my kids would call the dark ages, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have internet, we didn't even have cordless phones. And to call outside of your calling district was long distance. And you just didn't do long distance unless it was an emergency. Now, in my mind, talking to my fiancé was an emergency. In my parents' mind, it was a luxury. So we talked once a week on the phone, and once a week I got to go to Sedalia to see her. That was so frustrating, not being able to have much communication during that time when we were about to get married. Nowadays, we love to hear our, from our children, from our grandchildren. One of the things that really excites us is when the iPad <clears throat> starts making that sound that we know that it's FaceTime coming from overseas, and we get to visit with our overseas kids. That's a highlight, to be able to talk to our loved ones. And I will tell you, as much as I enjoyed visiting with Judy when we were engaged, I still enjoy it when she calls me during the day, gets a break. Honey, I just got a five-minute break. I want to see how you're doing. You love to hear communication from someone you love. We love to hear communication with our children. Now, let me put this on a spiritual perspective. Since we are made in the image of God... And God has created us for a relationship with Him. It doesn't it stand to reason that God delights to hear from His children? That God delights to have time in communication with us? And do you think that maybe God sometimes feels like He's being left out when we don't talk to Him for a period of time? Jesus set the expectation in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And I'm speaking this morning on the topic of the things God values. God values prayer. In Matthew 6, 5 through 8, he wrote, he said, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. Now let me ask you, <clears throat> was there one time in here when Jesus said, if you pray? No. He always said, when you pray. There was an expectation the God's created ones who are in a relationship with him are going to pray. And in Luke 18, 1, he said, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. If you've been through the study of experiencing God, the study that was used so phenomenally years ago, then you learn that one of the ways that God speaks to us by the, through the Holy Spirit is when we pray. And I will share with you, it's been a little over 21 years ago, I was pastoring in Oklahoma, in, in Tulsa, and started getting a phone, well, we were doing a study of experiencing God. And on Sunday night, October 25th, we were on the topic of your next big challenge. What's the God-sized challenge that he has for you? And we had share time that, that Sunday night, and, and one man stood up and said, Pastor, I'll be honest with you, I don't see the next God-sized challenge for our church. I don't know what it is. And I said, well, Gary, I don't either. I'm praying for that as well. Because we had gone through long-range planning. We'd gone to two worship services. We'd gone through a building program. We'd built two new buildings. We'd established some new missions. I mean, we had done a, a, a ton of things. I said, Gary, I don't either, but that's one of the things I'm praying for God to reveal. The next morning, Monday morning, my phone started ringing. It was some friends of mine from across the country said, Jim, there is a pulpit committee from a church in Lubbock, Texas, who's calling and asking about you. And um, I think it could be a good fit. I said, well... Thanks, hope you didn't have to lie too much to make me sound good, you know. But after about the fourth or fifth 
call from my friends. I thought, well, maybe I ought to do the spiritual thing and pray about this. So I turned off the phone, locked the door, and then did some time praying and, and kind of did the thing praying about, Lord, bless that church in Lubbock, Indiana Avenue Baptist Church. Bless them as they search for a pastor, and you've got the men picked out for them. Reveal to them who it is, and, and lead them to him in your timing. And then, Lord, while I'm praying, what is my next big challenge? And God clearly said, son, wake up. This is your next big challenge. God called me to be the pastor in prayer on Monday morning, October the 26th. Public committee chairman called me that night and said, we want to come out. I had such clear conviction that this is how it's going to work out. I told Judy, said, okay, prepare yourself. Here's what's going to happen. On such and such a date, they'll be here. Such and such a date, we'll go there. Such and such a date, we'll go in view of a call. I'll, ret I'll resign here on such and such a date, and I'll start pastoring there on this date. Such a clear, clear direction from God. Because he spoke to me in prayer. That's one of the ways in which God chooses to speak to us. Ian e. Bounds gives some insightful comments on prayer, and I'm going to give you some of his quotes. The apostles, above everything else, were praying people, and they left the stamp of their prayer example and teaching upon the early church. Unfortunately, the times are not prayerful times. Now, he wrote this a long, long time ago, but it's very descriptive of today. The times are not prayerful times. God's cause just now is in dire need of praying leaders. Other things may be needed, but this is the crying demand of those times and the urgent, the first need of the church. This lack of praying creates a crisis like that of a country admitting to an invading army that it cannot fight and knows nothing about the weapons of war. Wow. Wow. We get into spiritual conflict and we try and, buy and fight spiritual conflicts using fleshly weapons, but the weapons of spiritual warfare are not human intelligence, not human resources. The weapons of spiritual warfare are spiritual weapons and prayer. Now, let's, let's look at this passage of Scripture that, that I read just a moment ago, this, this Matthew 6 passage. If you look at verse 5, one of the things that, that Jesus said was the fact that God does not value performance prayers. He does not value performance prayers. Now, that is not to say that, that Jesus is against public prayers. Jesus commented, do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand in the public and make a big deal of what they're doing. He's not against public prayers. But here's the truth behind this. Public prayers must be an overflow of a vibrant personal prayer life. It's not just something you do to perform. It ought to be an outgrowth of who you are, of what you consistently do. Now, bear in mind, Jesus, as he is speaking, is speaking to Jewish people. No religion has ever had a higher standard and priority for prayer than Judaism. God's chosen people. They're the ones who received the written word of God. They received the Ten Commandments through Moses. They had a high priority on prayer. God spoke directly to Moses. He spoke directly through Abraham, through others as time went by. God's Holy Spirit had not fallen upon everybody, so to have a visit from God, from God's Holy Spirit, was a unique experience. And God often came down and visited with the Jewish people. So prayer should have been a high priority for them. No other people, as a race or as a nation, have been so favored by God as what the Jews were at this time. And of all people... Of all people, they should have known how to pray. But they didn't. It had become trivialized. Trivialized. It had become ritualized. They really didn't know how to pray. Their praying had been corrupted and perverted by, by tradition, by rabbinic tradition. And most Jews were completely confused about how to pray as God wanted them to pray. So I think Jesus is telling us that God does not value performance prayers. Well, what is a performance prayer? Well, it's praying with the wrong attitude. You see, the Jews had the option when they prayed of praying with sincerity or praying with indifference or just plain apathy or pride. They had those options. Jesus was attempting to correct them and show them that just going through the motion of prayer didn't really cut it. 
it's amazing how many people who think that if I just punch my spiritual time card, if I go to church for an hour on Sunday morning, or even if I go to Sunday school for an hour on Sunday morning, then I've done my religious duty for the week and I've put in my time. That's kind of what they were doing. I'm going to go through this ritual of prayer and I've punched my spiritual time clock and I'm in great standing before God. I've paid my dues for this week or for this day or for this hour. Total indifference. They were praying with the wrong attitude. Years later, James, the pastor of the church, would attempt to correct his church's prayer lives when he said, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you have on your pleasures with the wrong attitude. Basically, the same attitudes that destroy relationships will destroy public prayer. The same attitude that destroy businesses will destroy prayer. Jim Collins, in his best-selling book, Good to Great, talks about Bethlehem Steel. Many of you will remember the great steel magnet, the great industry, Bethlehem Steel. Uh, they, they were the dominant steel producer years and years ago. In 1966, a little company called Nucor started up, and they soon surpassed them, and Bethlehem Steel went bankrupt. And part of the reason was because of the hierarchy of pride that Bethlehem Steel developed among their corporate executives. Nucor had a servant leader type mentality. They, they didn't give corporate bonuses to the executives that were bigger than the people who were out on the, the tradespeople, the tradespeople, the people who were actually doing the hard work of it, they're the ones who received greater bonuses than did the corporate execs. And when there was a downturn, guess who took the biggest cut in salary? The CEO took a 75% cut. The vice presidents took a 60% cut. Some of the workers had to take a cut, but they didn't take nearly as much as the people up in the corporate office did. That was Nucor. That was not the attitude of Bethlehem Steel. Bethlehem Steel... Well, to quote Jim Collins, uh, Steele had a culture whereby the executives saw the very purpose of their activities as the perpetuation of a class system that ele elevated them to an elite status. Bethlehem Steele built a 21-story office complex to house its executive staff. And I don't know if it stands out to you or not, but that's not a square building. It's a building built in the shape of a cross. They spent extra money to build it in the shape of a cross not because they were religious and they wanted to model Christ. No. They did it because they needed more corner offices for their vice presidents. So they spent extra money to build it like this so that every floor, you would start counting them up. There are a bunch of corner offices because these vice presidents had to have two windows facing different directions. That was the pride. That was the arrogance. That was the indifference to who they really were. That was the wrong attitude of a corporation. That's the wrong attitude in prayer when prayer is more about me than it is about you. When I'm here to get out of it what I can get out of it, when I'm here to punch in my spiritual time card and get on with it, that's the wrong attitude. That is a performance prayer. Whether it's done in public or whether it's done in private, that is a performance prayer. What's well, a performance prayer? One that's a wrong prayer. In other words, prescribed prayers. Now, I'm not talking about written out prayers, but I'm talking in prescribed prayer. A faithful Jew, for example, would pray what's called the Shema in the morning and again at night. And it began, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then they do a compilation of, of scriptures out of Deuteronomy and out of Numbers. Very, good, very fine in itself. Another formalized prayer was the Shema, which embodied 18 prayers for various occasions. Faithful Jews prayed all 18 prayers three times a day. Do you think maybe it became a little rote after a period of time? The Shemaneya was originally designed to bring every aspect of life into God's presence. It lost meaning, it lost value, and it merely became a ritual. It can happen to us. It can happen in worship. I mentioned the church in Tulsa that I left to come to Indiana Avenue. It was a very traditional church. Not that there's anything wrong with being a traditional church. But you know what? Our, our worship pastor just wanted to sing the same songs over and over again. And, and we kind of got into a rut. And I knew I was in a rut when one Sunday morning, and, and back in those days, you sat on the platform. Remember when you'd sat on the platform, you didn't cross your legs. You sat here because you were the pastor. 
Never got to sit with Judy. I love the way we do it now. <laughs> but I knew I was in trouble when Sunday morning we started singing a hymn and I, I started planning out my week. And I scheduled my week. And I kind of reviewed my sermon in my mind and then I realized we're still on the first verse. I'd totally gotten lost. That's what I told myself. I've got to do something different about my worship because it no longer has value. It no longer has meaning. It's now just something I'm, I'm doing out of, out of just rote, out of routine. When our prayers, you know, we teach a child a little prayer now. I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Okay, that's fine to teach an infant to pray that, a small child to pray that. That's the beginning stages. But listen, when you're, when you're 45, when you're 65, your prayers should have grown a little bit beyond that. And it becomes a ritual. When we no longer think about what we're praying. We're just going through the motion. That's the wrong prayer. Praying at the wrong times. Now, a devout Jew would offer prayers at 9 o'clock, noon, and 3 o'clock. That's what Daniel did. It was a call to prayer for him. But for the Pharisees, for the ones that Jesus was speaking against, the reason that was the wrong time was because that's when they limited their prayers. If it was 4 o'clock and someone said, I have a prayer request, they'd say, I'm sorry, I'm through praying for the day. I prayed, I'll pray again for that at 9 in the morning, or I'll pray for it at noon, but I'm through for the day. Wrong times. Now, if you want to set a clock and remind yourself to pray, bless you for doing that. But they'd gotten down where I, I punched my spiritual clock. I prayed this morning at 9. I prayed the Shema. I prayed the Shema. And I, I prayed at noon. I prayed those prayers. I prayed at 3. I'm done for the day. They limit it to that time. No spontaneity in their prayers. That's a performance prayer. When you only pray at prescribed times, and that's when you restrict your prayers to that time. It's a prescription prayer. Uh, Performance prayer when it's the wrong length. The religious leaders believed the longer they prayed, the more spiritual they appeared and more effective their prayers would be. Consequently, their prayers became more like oral term papers. And anyone listening to them, you, you could kind of imagine, oh no, there's Rabbi Girl standing up to pray. We're going to be here for an hour and a half. You know, They would just go on and on and on, thinking maybe they could beat God down. Actually, I don't think that's what they thought because they weren't too concerned about if God heard them or not. They were more concerned if the people around them heard them. You see, these prescribed prayers they'd have, nine, I mean, nine in the morning, noon, three o'clock in the afternoon, wherever they were, they would stop and pray. Now, if you're on a street corner and you want to pray, that's a good thing to do. But don't schedule your time so, okay, I've got to schedule. So, I, oh, if I do this just right, I'll be at the street corner at noon when it's time to pray and I can start praying and everybody will see how sanctimonious I am because I'm praying at noon drawing attention to themselves, the wrong length. I can do this for a long time because I want everybody to see me. It's performance prayer when it's the wrong tone. Again, the meaningless repetitions just over and over again, that's the wrong tone. I'm in it for me, the wrong tone. And for the wrong audience. Performance prayer when it's for the wrong audience, for other men or to be seen of men. That is a performance prayer. God does not value that. That is a, an absolute waste of time. In Luke 18, 11, <laughs> the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. See, that's, that's the wrong prayer. That's a performance prayer. Sounding good to be heard of men. Well, let's... You know, how tragic, it was, how tragic it was for those Pharisees. They made a great pretense of prayer. But they were so out of touch with God, so out of tune with God, that they did not recognize God when He showed up in the flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. Now, if you look on, if you look at verse 6, you'll see that God values sincere prayer. Okay, what constitutes a sincere prayer? Just the opposite of what I've described. First of all, praying with the right attitude. What's the right attitude? Sincerity, honesty, humility. In James 5, 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one another that you may be healed. And then notice this. The effectual fervent prayer 
of a righteous man availeth much. Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for that day. John Bunyan said, in prayer it's better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. Coming in with the right attitude. And sometimes when you come in to pray, you don't, you don't even know what to pray. But the fact that you're recognizing, God, I am dependent upon you. That's coming in with the right attitude. God values sincere prayer with the right attitude, with, with the right prayer. What's the right prayer? One from the heart. One from the heart. There's no formula for proper prayer. Then next week we'll look at the model prayer. We often call it the Lord's Prayer. It's really the model prayer. And we'll look at that, and Jesus gave an example. It's a model, but there's really not a formula for what is the exact right way to pray or the wrong way to pray. <clears throat> I love in Luke 18, 13 and 14, about the tax collector, whom the Pharisee said, thank God I'm not like him. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. C.H. Spurgeon talked about groanings which cannot be uttered are often prayers that cannot be refused. God values sincere prayers that are prayed at the right time. What's the right time? When you pray. Going back to the scripture, Matthew 6, 5 through 8, Jesus said, when you pray. Now some, you know, the, the, the issue is not so much when as it is that you pray. That you pray. Now some argue that we should pray early in the morning, and, and they quote from the example of Jesus as found in Mark 1, 35, where it says, in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out, departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And I know a lot of the discipleship courses teach us to begin the day early in the morning. Get up early before the day begins and go out and pray. Well, maybe you don't function very well until 10 o'clock in the morning. Your prayers are not going to probably be very, very intelligible if you get up early just to pray when you're not really awake yet. I think we ought to be awake before we pray. But there, there's a great case to be made for beginning the day with prayer. Oswald Chambers said, we tend to use prayer as a last resort. But God wants it to be our first line of defense. We pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything at all. Well, I love that. Rick Warren says, the more you pray, the less you'll panic. The more you worship, the less you worry. You'll feel more patient and less pressured. Isn't that a great way to face a day? Many of us have trouble working prayer into early morning schedule. Well, look at the comment that Martin Luther made. I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. <laughs> I have so much to do. I shall spend, I must spend the first three hours in prayer to get them done. That's usually not who we are. I'm so busy. Oh, God, I'm sorry. You know I'm busy. Forgive me. I'll get back to you tomorrow. Boom, run and go. Luther was not the only one who felt that way. A.J. Gordon said, you can do more then pray after you have prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Pick a time that works for you and pray. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a one and done. You can pray throughout the day. What's a proper prayer? One that's the right length. And what is the right length? Pray until you get finished. Pray until you get finished. What's the right tone? Remember, the prayer is God's provision. It is God's provision. It's God's idea. It's not man's. There could be no prayer if God did not decide to speak to man, to speak with us. And we would not know how to pray had he not taught us. So when we come in, come in mindful that we are talking to our Heavenly Father as a child to his Father, a tone of worship, a tone of adoration, the right tone. And what kind of prayer does God value? when it's the right audience. And who's the right audience for prayer? God. God. 
Now, verse 7. I think Jesus is teaching us that God does not value what I call white noise in prayer. Y'all know what white noise is probably, don't you? You know, it, it's, it's the kind of background noise that blocks out everything else. We've got an air purifier in our home that's in our bedroom. It's by our bed. It's a white noise. It kind of blocks out some of the street sounds and things while purifying the air. White noise. White noise in prayer is just repeating the same thing over and over and over and over. And that's what the Pharisees used to do. Wrote repetition that had no meaning or no value. God really does not value that. God values sincere prayers from the heart, not just babbling on and on and on. Verse 8 tells us that God values sincere conversation. You see, God doesn't have to be beat down for Him to hear us. He wants to hear from us. Remember, prayer is His idea. I love what Rabbi Zacharias says when he said, I think the reason we sometimes have the false sense that God is so far away is because that's where we have put Him. We have kept Him at a distance and when we are in need and call on Him in prayer, we wonder where He is. He's exactly where we left Him. God wants sincere conversation and we can call upon Him. Leonard Ravenhill said, No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who's not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many riders, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. God values conversation. Now, perhaps you would say, you know, Jim, prayer is just not my thing. Well, let me ask you, are you a child of God? Have you claimed Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Then how can you possibly say that prayer is not your thing? Would you say, you know, I have a body, but breathing is just not my thing. I don't breathe anymore. You're not going to survive if you don't breathe. And I'm going to tell you, as a spiritual person, you're not going to thrive if you're not praying. Prayer is to the spiritual life what breathing is to the physical life. So let me, make you some, let me give you some suggestions on maybe getting started. And, and you may say, well, I'm kind of embarrassed now because I've been a Christian for a long time, but I, I haven't been a praying man or woman. Okay. Though no one can go back and make a brand new start, my friend, anyone can start from now and make a brand new end. And let's work on making a brand new end. Let me, let me give you just a simple prayer. If you haven't prayed in a while, if you wouldn't categorize yourself as a praying person, here's a simple prayer. Dear Jesus, how desperately I need to learn to pray. And yet when I'm honest, I know that I often do not even want to pray. I am distracted. I am stubborn. I'm self-centered. In your mercy, Jesus, bring my want-er more in line with my need-er so that when I come, so that I can come to want what I need. In your name and for your sake, I pray. Amen. And let me give you some practical suggestions on getting started. This is the beginning of a year. We often make New Year's resolutions. I don't want this to be a resolution. I want this to be a lifestyle. So some practical suggestions on developing a lifestyle of prayer, making your life to live in a culture of prayer. Set aside 10 minutes. You say, oh my goodness, what am I going to do for 10 minutes? Set a timer if necessary so that you're not praying, looking, and praying, and looking, and praying, and looking. Have I done it yet? Because I'll tell you, if you haven't prayed very much, haven't prayed in a while, 10 minutes is going to be a long time. Set a timer so you're not constantly distracted by looking back and forth. And if you run out of things to pray, then let me make a suggestion or two. Pray Scripture. One of the things you can do is pray Scripture. Well, how do I pray Scripture? Well, almost everybody knows John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then begin to pray that. Dear God, You told us that You love us. That You love the world so much that You sent Your Son. Thank You for sending. Thank You for loving us. Thank You for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son for me. Thank you that that I have everlasting life because I've asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. 
Thank you that I don't have to worry about perishing in, in a devil's hell. Oh, thank you for that, Father. The 23rd Psalms, the first part of that, our Father, I mean, the Lord is my shepherd. Thank you, Father, that you're my shepherd. I shall not want. Thank you that I may not have all of my wants needed, but, but I will not be in want. You're going to provide the basic things that I need in life. Thank you for that. Look at some of the scriptures. and Pray some of the Psalms, other Psalms. I think some of the most powerful praying that we do is when we pray scripture. When we give God's words back to Him. So if you have trouble praying, but even if you're not having trouble, pray scripture. If you're having trouble, let me suggest also that you pray some hymns. How great is our God. That's a great prayer. How great is our, how great thou art. Oh Lord my God. When I an awesome wonder. Pray that. Amazing grace. Oh God, thank you for that amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I know I once was lost, but thank you that I'm found. Thank you that, that I was blinded spiritually, but now I can see. Pray scripture. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Oh God, I want to trust you. I want to trust you. Help me in that ability to trust you. I want to be an obedient man, woman. Father, show me how obedience is to be lived out. You're going to find that 10 minutes goes by quicker than you think when you do some of these things. Maybe you have trouble concentrating, then let me suggest that you write your prayers. You know what? God can read. God can read. And as you're writing those prayers, you're thinking their thoughts, God can hear your thoughts as you pray. Or here's another suggestion. If you have trouble doing that, pray aloud. Go into an area, private area, and pray aloud. You'll be surprised how the sound of your voice as you're verbalizing things will, will help you. Help you focus on what you're saying and realizing what it's sounding like as you offer these prayers. We must be a praying people. We must be a praying people. The work of God can only be done within the power of God. And as a church, we must, and I know many of you pray, I know many of you do, but we're not doing a lot of prayer together as a church. There's not much corporate time in prayer that we're doing. So I'm calling us to prayer on Saturday nights. If you look in your worship guide, and you have permission to pick up your worship guide and look at it, if you'll open on the inside, look at, look at Saturday. And notice if I, it says Saturday, 5 o'clock, Saturday prayer. You don't know what that is. Let me tell you what it is. Judy and I are inviting you, and please, no pressure on this, and I know you can't come every time. But listen, on Saturday afternoons at 5 o'clock, meet us here in the commons. We'll have just a word or two of greeting, and then we're going to prayer walk this building. We'll come in here at the worship center. You look around and see where people are sitting, and guess what? Y'all pretty much sit in the same spot every week. When, when we come in here on Saturday and start walking around, we can look around and start praying for folks and, and realize who's, who's seated there and, and maybe know some of the struggles that they're going through. In the late service, our, our students, our, our youth, sit over here. So we can focus on praying for our students over here. A lot of our college students tend to sit right over here in the late service. So we can, <clears throat> we can focus on praying for our college students in the late service right here. We can walk through the building. We're not going to take a long time. We're not asking you to come and give two hours on Saturday night. But come for just a few minutes on Saturday evening at 5 o'clock. And we'll, we'll, we'll prayer walk the worship center. And we'll walk throughout the building. We'll, we'll go over in the student section and, and we'll prayer, pray walk that area. We'll, we'll walk through the preschool. I'll open it up and we'll walk through that preschool area. And we'll pray for our babies. We'll go downstairs in the children's area. And we'll pray for our children on Saturday nights. We'll try and set the tone what's going to take place. We used to do that at Indiana Avenue Baptist Church. And you know who three of the faithful ones were to show up that night on Saturday nights? Chris Galanis, pastor of Experience Life Church. Clayton Walker, associate pastor at Experience Life Church. Phil Gilbert, one of the staff members at Experience Life Church. That's when they were still in college. Still in college. 
I'm asking you to come join us on Saturday evening, 5 o'clock. We chose 5 o'clock because that's early enough in the afternoon. We can pray together, and if some of you want to go out and eat together, that'd be great. We've got to be a praying church, especially as we're getting closer now to calling a pastor. I don't think the search committee is ready to call somebody yet, but they've got some names that they're looking at a little more seriously. We want to be in prayer for them that they find just the right man that God has to be our pastor. We've got to be building them up. Chris Galanis is going to be sharing something with us, uh, maybe through me, but we want to set in a couple of weeks 30 days of prayer, which we're going to ask you to take a time slot throughout the day for 30 days and just know that during that time you're going to be praying and ask that you write down maybe some of your prayers. And when our new pastor gets here, to be able to hand that new pastor some of the prayers to know how we have been praying for him before he got here. I can tell you as a pastor who's arrived on a field on a new church to read the prayers of my people will be phenomenal. We've got to be a praying church. So these are some suggestions. Of course, the most important prayer that anyone ever prays is to pray the ABCs, to admit that you're a sinner, Believe that Jesus is the only one who can save you and choose to receive him as your Savior and Lord. If you haven't prayed that prayer, then I want to invite you to do it today. We're going to stand and sing in a moment. Young Sack and Al's going to come back. And as we sing, if the Spirit of God is drawing you to himself, I invite you to step out and come forward. And Judy or I, one, will be glad to pray with you. Provide as a spiritual coach to you to receive Christ today. If you're looking for a church home, I invite you to join Bacon Heights. We've got a pastor coming. We don't know when it's going to be. But you're not joining a pastor. You're joining a church. We invite you to become a part of this church. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, in these next few moments, I pray that your spirit will work unhindered in our midst. Father, draw people into yourself. That's my prayer today, Father. Draw people into yourself. And Father, may we be a praying church. Oh, Father, may we be a praying people. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. They sing. If you need to respond to God's call, step out.